So, hey guys, a little bit of a different video today. I asked what kind of content you wanted, since there are no matches being played. And the top comment was, uh, why don't you show us your own tactics and really go in depth into the depth, so in depth into the tactics you did use. Um, so for today, I thought I make a video on uh, game models. So I will show you the theoretical background of a game model, uh, basically how I created my game model and how you can create your own game model. And I will add that, or I, I will add to that the practical application of myself as a coach. So I will tell you how you can create a game model and I will tell you how I play, how I answer certain things. And in the end, I will show you some uh, like the practical stuff, how I actually play with my own teams. So a game model. Uh, a game model is basically the way that you want to play with your, with your team, how you want to uh, address games, but you want to train on like the entire way of how you want to play. So not just like a formation, but the formation, all the principles, all the other things that you want from your team. So uh, your game model is, in my opinion, created by four, uh, like four pillars. First of all, are your principles as a coach. Uh, second pillar is the qualities of the players that you have uh, available in that team at the moment. Third is the culture of the country. And fourth are directions of the board. So your main coaching principles. I think this is the most important part of the game model because these are the principles that you want in your team no matter what. So basically it doesn't matter if you're coaching Stoke City, it doesn't matter if you're coaching like France second division or if, or if you're coaching Barcelona Liverpool. These are principles that you always want to see in your own teams. So for me those are uh, zonal defense. I think it's important to distinguish that it's not just either men marking or zonal marking, but it's like a spectrum and then you have zonal mark on one end with men marking on the other end. And then you're like somewhere on that spectrum. But I like to be on the more zonal side of the spectrum. So it depends a bit on the context, how much I can go to that zonal phase, which I will talk about later a little bit. Uh, but I prefer zonal over men marking. Uh, second principle I have is a fast build up. Which basically means that if I can get to the opponent's goal within two or three passes, I will always want my players to choose that option. Like, I get building out from the back, I appreciate it. Um, I think it can be a very, very good way of playing, but it's not necessarily my way of playing. If I can play two or three, perhaps a bit more risky passes, uh, like further forward, I prefer those kind of passes instead of a lot of horizontal passes, a lot of recyclation, I don't, that's not my way of playing. Uh, my third principle is runs in behind. Uh, I think it's very important to always have players making runs in behind, trying to get in behind the, the opponent, putting questions on the opponent, uh, like will they drop off, will they keep a high line. I think it's a very, very important, uh, it's a very important part of my way of playing. My fourth principle is a secure rest defense, and for those who don't know, a rest defense is the players you keep behind the ball while you are attacking. And with a secure rest defense, I mean that I want at least four, preferably five, perhaps even no, not that much more, but I think five, perhaps six at certain points. Players behind the ball taking care of the defense, because that ensures that we don't get a lot of counters against us it allows us to recycle position more more effectively and it ensures is that we are able to control the transition phases which brings to the next point which is quick transitions like the way of the transition so for example when you lose the ball you can either counter press so immediately press the ball with everyone or you can basically everyone fall back into your defensive shape and then it's a little bit more complicated than that. There are a little bit more decisions to be made. But in general, you can either do one of two, one of those two things. So either counter press or fall back. So the way in which I do my transition, like the practical application, depends on the players and context. But I always want the transitions to be executed as quickly as possible by the entire team. So there's no one like 
jogging back. No, when we lose the ball, all 11 players have a transition immediately and immediately get into defensive uh, shape or defensive positions. Next one is field occupation focusing on center and half spaces. I don't like playing over the wings. You're easily pressed there. I don't really like playing with crosses, which I will come to next. So I only keep one player wide on each side, which is like either a winger or a fullback. Uh, depends again on practical applications. But I don't play with like winger and fullback on both sides on the outer part of the pitch. I think it's, it, it's disconnective for the... It disconnects your players from each other because the distance has become too big. In addition, passes over the outside corridors are kind of useless. So I don't want two players in those corridors anyway. Yeah, but yeah, for example, I well, I will come to that later. But it brings us to the to the last one. I like to have my width in the midfield. Uh, so I want one player to get the width that can either be like a fullback in a high position or just the winger in his regular position. But I like to have the one player that keeps the width on each side. I want them to be in like a midfield slash attacking position. So for example, I don't usually play a four for two diamond. That's not a formation I would. That would be like my first choices because it it lacks. It has a lot of players in the center and half spaces, but it lacks width in the midfield areas. So you have to be really like create that width. There's no natural width. You really have to create the width with like players making runs and players getting into different positions. So the last one are low crosses. I'm not sure if you know, but they did a statistical analysis on crosses in football. And they found that from all the high crosses played in like professional, I think it was Premier League, only one in about 80 crosses actually converts into a goal. So if you think about it, it's, it's a really, really, really low number. And they found that there are two types of crosses that are actually like statistically way more effective. And those are either a low cross in between the space between the goalkeeper and the defenders or a cutback cross. So a player like making a run to the to the goal line and then cutting it back to a player on like the, the penalty spot. So I prefer to play with those two types of crosses. I don't prefer to play with high crosses, especially youth football. Because then the runs in front of goal have to be good, the high cross has to be good, you have to be able to have, do a good header. There are a lot of duels with defenders that can be lost. Um, and there are like three or, but with like a high cross, you need three or four players inside the box to actually hit the ball, which then uh, again comes to the rest defense because you have already four players in the box plus a player playing the cross, which is already five, so the rest defense is not optimally organized so i prefer to play with low crosses another important thing i put at the bottom here principles can change and evolve throughout your career like for example i'm not coaching for what five six years something so this is like my game model now but like it's not set in stone it's like when you evolve as a person and as a coach you learn new things you get different ideas then your game model changes. So this this is like my principles right now. Could be that in one or two years, um, I perhaps added three new ones and I removed two of one two two of the ones that I have right now. It's it's not set in stone. It's something that can evolve. So the second important thing is the qualities of the player. So in my personal opinion, the qualities of the player determine how we're going to play. So both in a way of formation. So Let's say if you have two good strikers, then I would always say I play a formation with two strikers. So 4-4-2, four, 4-4-2 four, two, four, four, two diamond, 3-5-2, uh, something like that. And uh, the quality of the player determine the way of playing. So are we going to build out from the back? Are we going to play a long ball? Are we going to press with fullbacks? Are we going to press uh, high? Are we going to fall back? I know that there are a lot of coaches that basically... I have their formation as a principle, so I always play 4-3-3, uh, or I always play out from the back. Personally, I don't like that. I don't, because it's not applicable to to different contexts, and I think that your principles should be applicable to every single context that you encounter. For example, if you're two good strikers, to me personally, it doesn't really make sense to play with only one. In addition, for example, you have a quick fullback, 
then you can have your fullback make overlapping runs. You can uh, press with your fullback. But if your fullback is quite slow, then you have to you have to change it because it doesn't make sense to like press with your fullback and try to have him make runs from like 40 meters when he's when he's one of the slowest in the team. And in the back of our central defenders cave of playing out from the back, because in my opinion, if they're not like we don't play out from the back. Um, if they are, we play out from the back. We can't of like that's an option to play out from the back, but it depends on the qualities of the players. Of course, in youth football, it can be a little bit different because, for example, like under 11s, under 12s, under 13s, like you can't expect the players to have all the qualities, so you need to teach them the qualities. But because that's a little bit different between like youth football and professional football. The third aspect is the culture of the country. Because the culture of the country influenced the way that the players themselves want to play and it influenced the way your opponents play. So for example, I'm from the Netherlands and here everyone plays 4-3-3 or 4-2-3-1 and we're all building out from the back. So let's say I suddenly want to play a 4-4-2 and I only want to play long to my striker and I want to play from the second ball. First of all, my own players can like feel resistance against that way of playing because they're not used to it and they're like basically they basically have learned throughout the years from the culture that that way of playing is not the right way uh, to play because they're so used to like four for three playing out from the back that's how you're supposed to play football because not really because it's, that's like a truth or something but because that's what they all have been taught for the past like what 15 16 17 years so if you suddenly want to play very, very differently, then you first need to tell your players like why you want to do that. And you need to see if your players are actually open to playing in that way. Um, in addition, for example, if I coach an under 17 side here in the Netherlands and all they've done is play 4-3-3 man marking in their defensive stages for like the past 12 years, and I suddenly want to play a 4-4-2 with zonal defense, then I really have to see if my players are ready for that because you just you can't suddenly just throw in very different things that they have never experienced before and expect them all to understand it. Uh, so you have to see like you have your own principles, but you have to look at okay what what are the players used to. So how can I find a combination between what they are used to and how I want to play in the ideal way? Because you can't just suddenly expect players to to learn a completely different style of play in a different formation within a couple of weeks that, that especially youth left that takes like months and months and months the final thing the culture influences how your opponents will line up so for example let's again say i want to play a 4 for 2 in the netherlands and almost everyone plays 4 3 3 that means that almost every single game i'm going to be in a 2 versus 3 underload in midfield so the opponent's gonna have like a man up so i need to prepare myself for that i need to see okay how am i going to defend that and do I have the players to that are like intelligent enough to understand that we need to fix that and that players need to shift to that free player? And are my players good enough to deal with a two against three underload in case that ever happens? The fourth and final stage are the directions of the board. I think especially in professional football, there are of course teams that say that they want the team to play a certain way. Also in, in youth football, you have team, for example, a lot of teams are, are like forced to play 4 3 3. You're not allowed to play a different formation. So you can only play a different formation if you. Uh, so basically, you're forced to play 4 3 3. They tell you that until like the under 70s or under, under 19s, four, you have to play either 4 3 3 or 4 2 3 1. So you know, okay, I, I have to stick to that formation and then you have to add the, that to your, to your principles and the qualities of the players. So let's get to the practical uh, side of it. A little bit of background information. I coached under 11s, under 12s over the last two years. So those were those in the Netherlands. Those teams play uh, eight against eight. So I will start with that, and then I will move over to how I play with 11 versus 11 teams. Uh, also important to realize that youth football players are not the same as professional players. You can't expect them to know everything. You can't expect to do everything. So the conditions weren't sufficient to implement all my principles. And I will tell you a little bit about that later. But just keep that in mind. Like I said, there are principles that are non-negotiable, but sometimes you have to tweak the principles a little bit to, to suit them to your current context.
So here's the practical application of how I played with my under 11 and under 12s. I will go into how I play with like 11 versus 11 teams in a bit. Uh, so we played 8 against 8 on half the pitch and basically both the sides. So they're like 3 meters from here are cut off and it's 3 meters from here. So a little bit smaller pitch than you see here with Chiketi ID. Basically I first started by looking at what most of our opponents would do. So I knew that most opponents, uh, which are the Reds, would play a 3. So 3 at the back, 1 midfielder, 3 forward, 3-1-3 three, three formation. So then I went on to look, so what can I do against it? How can I ensure that with my formation or my way of playing, I have always an advantage uh, over them? And I did that by looking at the qualities of my players. I had, I think at the start, two, maybe three players that are really good at defending, but then also at joining the midfield and creating play from here. So what I did was instead of playing a 3-1-3 during attack, so when we had the ball, when we had a ball, uh, I wanted him to move into midfield. I wanted those to basically become center backs and these two went wide and he moved up. And I basically played a 2-4-1 with a diamond in midfield. So what this usually meant was that the opponents would basically always man mark. So here at the back, and now at that he went, those went usually on the press. He was either, I put him a bit to the side because the gaps were a bit bigger. Either he was like kind of lazy because he's a striker. So then he had the gaps right here and right here. And he would just position himself here. He went on to position himself here and I could just have my keeper play with there first touch forward and then you immediately have a five against four against the opponent's goal in case if he dribbles towards him and attracts him plays it to him and now we have a four against three towards the opponent's goal because the field is so small you've basically you create a small overload two against one somewhere and you're just immediately creating a scoring chance so i think that this this pattern or like in a way of this pattern with a five against four or a four against three being created, it happened at least three or four times every single game, like every single game. Um, mainly because like this strike will always never fall back all the way here. Um, so also the advantage. The only problem, of course, when we didn't play out the advantage, and then they can suddenly have three against two or four against two against my central defenders. Um, luckily, the pitch wasn't very big, so. He was usually able to recover. When he went on too far, I wanted him to stay back. So I always had three players at the back. Usually it went okay. But the central defenders were quite capable in defending in underloaded situations. We practiced it a couple of times. It didn't, like we had goals coming from counters against us, but not sufficient as in like that it was really an issue for us. Another advantage that the formation gave me, let me put it back for you is that because i put both my wingers lower than usual because let's say i play with three strikers or you tell kids we play with three strikers they'll stand like this you know so then the defenders are also near each other the way i said we play with with the you know, midfielders we play with a diamond in midfield so i position them here and here so then that cost both of their fullbacks to run on to my uh, midfielders or, or wingers. So that caused like spaces here and a space here for my striker to move into. So he had a lot of space to move into. So what a lot of times happened was, for example, he was a bit there, uh, ball was played to him, he would make himself available. Ball was played here, he would come, and then he could make it run into the corner here. The ball was played there, and then he would step out and then he could run into the center. So that was also very, very beneficial for us. Um, yes, yeah, some other patterns that I used were with a lot of like ball play to him. He went on to press, he would come short, uh, pull him out. Ball was played here, or they would boost a bit like there. They make like the inside run, give and go like that. And then striker would move to the side of the ball, uh, attract him, he would move up there. Then ball would be played to the striker, 
Um, so I got a couple of options. He could lay it off to uh, oh, go. With. He could uh, lay it off to him, and he could run on uh, attacking mid for either come underneath, receive, and then play it forward, or uh, he could like make the run there. A couple of times he could just play that pass. Yeah, I think. Uh, defensively. Defensively, I did went to a 3 one free most of the time. Because this makes more sense. Because otherwise, your central defender is defending like here, and then their striker is left free. So, went like this. Uh, I usually chose to just fall back, make it nice and compact, because there's no offside in these types of games. So, like, let's, if they all move up, then you just have a lot of space in your midfield because they, they can't move up. Because if they move up, then he can just play it in behind because there's no offside. So with it was if we, we fall back. When the dead ball is played, we didn't press. We just tried to minimize these gaps so that he couldn't receive. Then his job was to take out the passing lane to the striker mainly, so he was a bit more there. Um, and then when the ball was played to him and he was in quite a high position, he would press, he would go short on him, he would provide cover. He would move inside, he would press out, um, he would press onto him, he would move to that side, he would move inside. And then we try to basically get him here, and if, if he played back, then he can just continue his press. It went okay, this. This was perhaps a little bit too hard for 11 and 12 year olds. It went very, very well in the first half of the season, where we became champions. It became less when the opponent started to differ their way of build up because a lot of teams we went to like a higher competition with all the champions from our region and then you had a lot of teams that uh, put one fullback on very high and then moved him inside because right now you already see problems because then he already has to drop all the way down there so he's not here anymore and then like basically the the, the build up shape becomes a lot different like if there did, a lot of this happened so one fullback very high, winger drops, winger inside, it became too too difficult to be in like a zonal compact shape. Which is also what I mentioned with the, the playing principles, because I prefer a zonal shape, but be it became too hard when the opponent started to do things like this. We were forced into different kind of shapes, so I went back to a more man marking style, which is you follow him, you can follow him, uh, like more like this. Because it just it was it was beginning too too com too complicated. Finally, the practical application of the eleven vs eleven games. So first of all, I haven't coached eleven vs eleven teams myself. I will do like next year. Will be based on my first year on a decent level coaching eleven against eleven. Therefore, it's not. These are more like my general ideas of how I usually would do it, but it's not really as as elaborated as the. 8 against 8 was. So a couple of things. So again, my team is the blue team, red team on the opponents. Uh, usually I would go, well, you're basically forced to either play 4, 2, 3, 1, or like 4, 3, 3. So usually I go for a 4, uh, for a 4, 2, 3, 1. I like the structure better. Usually gives you a bit of a better rest defense base. Otherwise, with usually like one midfielder here, you can have that they are too advanced, and that when you lose the ball, you lose a lot of the second ball. So usually, I go for four, two, three, one. So basically, in the Netherlands during a match, it usually looks a little bit like this. So, like in general, lines looks a bit like this. First thing is that I usually want my two central defenders to play at the striker. So, in case he starts pressing here, he can just play here. And if he has the capabilities, I want him to like dribble into midfield, see if he can find an opening. We want the central defenders as the ball. I usually want the striker to move uh, to the side of the ball. I want him to be 
basically make his horizontal line on like the last line of the defense and then make himself available as the vertical option. I usually want my attacking midfielder to be on the far side because for example uh, if he drops a bit and he pulls in with him I want my number 10 to be able to make the blind side runs in behind make a lot of those runs uh, again I want like one of the, the fullback on the outside the wingers more on the inside and I use a lot of opposite movements so for example the striker and the attacking midfielder just showed but also like a lot of um, this player moving inside and moving towards the ball with him following and immediately the ball in behind for the fullback because also like if he loses this ball for example he follows and he wins the ball then I again have like seven eight players in immediately good positions to defend if they recover in time they're just in shape ball if he's like here and he plays it to him and he loses it then it gives you immediately it gives you trouble uh, defensively I usually try to press high up because mainly the most teams try to play out from the back and most especially youth teams they don't really have the necessary qualities to play out from the back all the time so it gives you quite quite a lot of options if you if you press quite high usually f my preferred way at the moment is to your striker weight and have him like pass to uh, either of the center backs <clears throat> so either of the center backs so for example you now place to him then your striker now starts pressing him uh, this winger immediately moves inside trying to press him if he uh, tries to attempt that pass and then your winger goes here and everyone here just gets tight on the ball now, in case he does manage to make this switch I want um, this fullback to immediately sprint out and press him he then takes the winger so then we go one we one at the back but I like to to step forward with with the fullback because there are also like ways in which you uh, let's say for example he does this and then there are teams that press with the midfielder and then this midfielder has to go there or this center back has to move up and he, he stays here but I don't really like it because it's more players having to pass over their opponent to another player and it's often that like this midfielder moves out but then the taking over this midfielder isn't like this midfielder isn't taken over in time or he moves there and then like he can't move there anymore so I like to move out with the fullback because I think it's it's easier way of pressing so yeah Basically that was it guys, this uh, 11 first level is a bit shorter because I haven't played it with like one of my own teams uh, for a full season. So when I have done it I have more practical examples of what I really do in reality and these are more like general ideas. Again very different video from normally, uh, let me know in the comments if you like it, uh, leave the thumbs up if you like it. If you hated this and <laughs> don't want me to do it ever again, just give it a thumbs down and then, uh, then I'll know it. So uh, I'll see you guys next time and uh, thanks for watching.